This is the lecture in which we really get down to the business of seeing how sentences grow, or to be even more precise, how we can grow our sentences. That agricultural metaphor is actually appropriate because sentence growth starts with what we'll call a kernel sentence. And here I go again, introducing a term that's a little confusing because we will use it to refer to several different situations, each presenting the sentence in a different way. Or to put the case another way, we'll use the term kernel sentence, not to refer to the formal characteristics of a sentence such as length or degree of complexity or the number of the propositions the sentence advances. Instead, we'll use this term to refer to different situations in which the kernel is the initial building block to which we will add information. Confused yet? I am just a little bit, and it's my term. But here's what I mean by different situations in which the kernel sentence is the starting point for building longer and more effective sentences. A kernel sentence may consist of but a single word, Remember General McAuliffe's answer of nuts to the German demand that he surrendered during the Battle of the Bulge? But McAuliffe's single word reply obviously worked as a sentence and not just as a noun. I'm not sure whether his message to the Germans was meant to be understood as, you must be nuts to think I'm going to surrender, or nuts to you, or something similar. But his celebrated answer reminds us that a kernel sentence can contain only a single word. We probably shouldn't mess with kernel sentences of the single word variety, since they almost certainly are most important and most effective precisely because of their dramatic terseness. In a slightly different situation, the kernel sentence is simply about as short as it can be, and each proposition we add to it seems to turn the sentence in a new direction with it taking several of these turns before it, come, before it becomes clear what the sentence is trying to do. For example, given the kernel sentence, they slept, almost anything we add to it will make it more satisfying in terms of propositional information. They slept, having finally found a campsite sheltered from the freezing rain. They slept. The man simply collapsing on the bed, the woman first seeing what TV channels were available. They slept and they dreamed. Or, they slept, a sleep deeper and more relaxing than they had even dreamed possible, a sleep that was itself undisturbed by dreams. Or, they, who had never before considered sleep a luxury, slept. In these cases, the kernel sentence only advances a kernel of information so that we might add to the sentence, so what we might add to the sentence can turn it in a number of different directions. Frankly, kernel sentences of this short and this, star, this, short and this stark also probably serve a dramatic function that's more important than adding information might be. But it is good to remember that a sentence so short it can't be made any shorter, they slept, is the most extreme example of a kernel sentence. In yet another situation, the kernel sentence gives us more propositional information and follows the common sentence pattern of providing a subject, a verb, and an object. The girl raised the flag. In this case, the kernel sentence provides us with four obvious opportunities to provide more propositional information. Information focused on the entire base clause, the girl raised the flag, on its subject, the girl, on its verb, raised, or on its object, flag. Adding to this kernel, we might get, the girl raised the flag because she knew that doing so would inspire her compatriots. Or, the girl who had just realized she was the only survivor raised the flag. Or, the girl raised the flag, triumphantly racing it up to the top of the flagpole. Or, the girl raised the flag, its green striped fabric tattered and torn by bullets. Or finally, the girl raised the flag and was proud to see it waving once again over the town square. In this situation, 
A kernel sentence provides us great starting points for elaboration and clarification. It's this second sense of the term kernel sentence we will face most frequently as we improve our writing. Here, the kernel sentence serves as an invitation for more propositional content, implying questions about the subject, the verb, or the object, and when we answer any of those implicit questions by adding information to the sentence, we will make it more effective. And still another situation exists at the opposite end of the continuum from those irreducibly short kernel sentences such as, they slept. As a matter of fact, this last main situation is one most frequently faced by writers who hope to improve their sentences. This is the situation of almost any sentence, of almost any length or complexity. This sentence may already advance a number of propositions, but it advances propositions to which we can still add useful detail or clarification. The fact is that most of the sentences we write aren't actually that long or that complicated. Most can be improved by adding propositions that help explain the sentence or by adding details that clarify information it advances. In this sense, a relatively lengthy and complicated sentence should not necessarily discourage us from making it even longer and even more complicated as long as the additions we make are helpful, logical, and easy to follow. Consider the sentence. Cumulative sentences fascinate me with their ability to add information that actually makes the sentence easier to read and more satisfying, flying in the face of the received idea that cutting words rather than adding them is the most effective way to improve writing. Now this rather complicated sentence of over 40 words becomes a kernel sentence if we use it as the starting point for an even longer sentence that advances even more propositions. Thus, we might build from this kernel sentence the following. Cumulative sentences, those loose sentences that quickly posit a base clause and then elaborate it by adding modifying words and phrases, fascinate me with their ability to add information that actually makes the sentence easier to read and more satisfying answering questions as it provides more detail and explanation, flying in the face of the received idea that cutting words rather than adding them is the most effective way to improve writing. Or, we might write, cumulative sentences that start with a brief base clause and then start picking up new information, much as a snowball gets larger as it rolls downhill, fascinate me with their ability to add information that actually makes the sentence easier to read and more satisfying because it starts answering questions as quickly as an inquisitive reader might think of them, using each modifying phrase to clarify what has gone before and to reduce the need for subsequent explanatory sentences, flying in the face of the received idea that cutting words rather than adding them is the most effective way to improve writing reminding us that while in some cases less is indeed more, in many cases more is more, and more is what our writing needs. Whew. I can't prove that either of those extended examples is actually a better sentence than the one we started with, but I would argue that neither is hard to follow, and both contain extra propositional information which adds to their effectiveness. But that's neither here nor there. The point is that both of these examples build from a kernel sentence that functions as a kernel by being the starting point for adding propositions. We need the term kernel in this situation only to remind us of the sentence we started with. Accordingly, depending on the situation, a kernel sentence may be, number one, the shortest possible sentence, possibly consisting of only one or two words, usually a sentence so dependent on its brevity for drama that we don't really want to add to it. Two, a very brief sentence containing a subject and a verb 
that may need to remain brief for dramatic effect, but that calls for at least some development in subsequent sentences before it makes much sense. Three, a predicative sentence that has a subject, a verb, and possibly an object, but nothing more. This is a sentence that invites development because it leaves so much unsaid. Or four, a sentence of any length that we take as a starting point for adding information, for developing the sentence by elaborating on the steps it already takes. So, kernel sentence is one of those multitasking terms we can't seem to avoid when talking about sentence style, a term that can refer to quite different sentences depending on the situation of their use. Kernel sentences can themselves create a kind of writing style. In fact, we might think of this style as the starting point for all other styles. Kernel sentences that simply posit information without detail or explanation offer the most basic form of predication. These sentences state something and then leave it to subsequent sentences to add information, if indeed information is ever going to be added. Highly predicative prose isn't long on explanations and has a kind of take-it-or-leave-it quality. This is macho speak that bluntly posits information without reflecting upon it or elaborating it, and we find it exactly where we might expect to find it. His name was Rambo, and he was just some nothing kid for all anybody knew standing by the pump of a gas station at the outskirts of Madison, Kentucky. He had a long, heavy beard, and his hair was hanging down over his ears to his neck, and he had a handout trying to thumb a ride from a car that was stopped at the pump. This is how David Morell began his 1972 novel, First Blood, and his famous protagonist shares his narrator's preference for simple declarations. Later in the novel, when Rambo briefly considers surrendering to the authorities who are hunting him, he quickly dismisses the thought. Then he would throw down his rifle and hold up his hands and yell that he was surrendering. The idea revolted him. He couldn't let himself merely stand and wait for them. He'd never done it before. It was disgusting. We refer to these short, simple sentences and simple compound sentences as being predicative, and they are characteristic of the style Walker Gibson calls tough, a style frequently associated with some of Ernest Hemingway's best-known fiction. In his 1966 study, Tough, Sweet, and Stuffy, an essay on modern American prose styles, Gibson closely examines the celebrated first paragraph of Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms. In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house in a village that looked across the river and the plain to the mountains. In the bed of the river, there were pebbles and boulders, dry and white in the sun, and the water was clear and swiftly moving and blue in the channels. Troops went by the house and down the road, and the dust they raised powdered the leaves of the trees. The trunks of the trees were dusty and the leaves fell early that year, and we saw the troops marching along the road and the dust rising and leaves stirred by the breeze falling and the soldiers marching and afterward the road bare and white except for the leaves. Gibson explains this highly predicative style is tough because its speaker, Frederick Henry, Hemingway's protagonist, says only what he could see or directly experience during a limited period of time linking observations primarily with conjunctions, stating information without processing it. This predicative style is very effective when creating tough guy characters, men and women who act but don't think much about what they do. It's a style that Will Strunk would be hard pressed to criticize, although I doubt he ever wanted any of his students to write exactly this way. Needless to say, the strongly predicative style is not one I'll be advocating for effective writing, unless you want to write tough guy narratives. The highly predicative style seems to me to introduce the reader to a mind that is amazingly unreflective, almost anesthetized, or so focused on one purpose 
that it simply refuses to think about anything else or consider alternate points of view. Now that mindset is great for Rambo, but I don't think that's the mind we most want to introduce to our readers unless our goal is to intimidate them. Accordingly, I'm much more concerned with how we move beyond a highly predicative style than I am with offering it as a goal. And the rest of this lecture will focus on the ways in which we can move beyond the tough guy rhetoric of strong predication. Once we have a kernel sentence of any length, there are three, and only three, basic approaches we can take to building it. We can add propositional information simply by using conjunctions or other connective words to add to the sentence in much the same way we might add more boxcars to a train. We can add propositional information by subordinating some parts of the sentence to other parts. Or we can add propositional information by using modifying words and phrases that turn underlying propositions into modifiers. Our earlier discussion of kernel sentences has already given us examples of these three fundamental strategies. Given that kernel sentence, the girl raised the flag, we can see an example of the first strategy in the sentence, the girl raised the flag and was proud to see it waving once again over the town square. The conjunction and here adds a new proposition that the girl was proud to see the flag waving once again over the town square to give us a compound sentence. Similarly, we might use a connective word such as because to get a new extended sentence that not only advances the proposition that she raised the flag, but also explains why. The girl raised the flag because she knew that doing so would inspire her compatriots. Sentences we build using this strategy simply add on information and we can call our syntactic strategy or move connective. The second strategy for building a sentence is to add new information, but to make it subordinate to information in the kernel. So, given the kernel, the girl raised the flag, we can add the proposition that the girl had just realized she was the only survivor by putting that information in a subordinate relative clause. The girl who had just realized she was the only survivor, raised the flag. Similarly, we might have added new information about the flag by putting it in a subordinate relative clause. The girl raised the flag that had long been a symbol of the resistance movement. When we subordinate information by putting it in clauses introduced by relative pronouns such as who or which or that, we create sentences in which we can call our syntactic strategy subordinative. And the third main strategy for building a sentence is to add new information to it by boiling that information down to a single modifying word or to a modifying phrase. For instance, we can add the proposition that the girl was young simply by writing, the young girl raised the flag. Or we can add information in modifying phrases that follow the base clause. The girl raised the flag, a triumphant grin on her face, the flag's green striped fabric tattered and torn by bullets, her bravery an inspiration to her compatriots. When we extend a sentence primarily by adding modifying words and phrases, we adopt a syntactic strategy we might call adjectival. Of course, we can and usually do combine two or even all three of these strategies when we build a longer sentence. But it's fascinating to me that there are only three main ways in which we can build more effective sentences. And we term those three main strategies connective, subordinative, and adjectival. Now, as it happens, most of my emphasis in this course will be on learning to use adjectival strategies to write more effectively. But I think it's very important that adjectival strategies are only one of three main ways in which we can build longer sentences. Now, let's try to put this notion of three main strategies for lengthening sentences toward an even more useful sense of how sentences work. 
These three strategies point toward three different ways that a sentence can take a step forward, making new information a part of the way we experience it. Pioneering poet and style theorist Josephine Miles, the first woman to gain tenure in the English department at Berkeley, has given a lot of thought to the way in which we might think of sentences as a series of steps, and I am greatly indebted to her for this important insight. In her 1967 book, Style and Proportion, The Language of Prose and Poetry, Miles herself employed a stunning sentence to introduce us to a new way of thinking about sentences. Prose proceeds forward in time by steps less closely measured, she wrote, but not less propelling than the steps of verse. She explained, quote, while every few feet verse reverses, repeats, and reassesses the pattern of its progression, prose picks up momentum toward its forward goal in strides, variably adapted to its burdens and purposes. Both use steps, neither merely flows. Each may be perceived and followed by its own stages of articulation." End of quote. Leave it to a poet to literalize the practice of measuring poetic meter in terms of feet and to remind us, yes, that feet take steps. More important, Miles reminds us that the language of prose moves forward in time, one word following another, just as surely as does the language of poetry. Poetry calls attention to its movement by meter, by line stops, by sentences, by rhyme schemes, by stanzas, while prose measures its unfolding in ways much less obvious, but no less certain. She obvious, I'm, I'm sorry, she offers as an example the following sentence. Early in the morning, in a small town, Near the highway, because he was hungry and though he was in danger, the young boy, looking neither to left nor to right, climbed the path to the city hall. Miles marks the steps this sentence takes typographically, putting spaces between its steps. Early in the morning, in a small town, near the highway, because he was hungry, and though he was in danger, the young boy, looking neither to left nor to right, climbed the path to the city hall. She then analyzes the way this sentence moves forward. As she says, the sentence takes a step. Its verb locates itself in time and relation. The boy climbed the path. Subject acts upon object in past tense. The rest of the material of the sentence is additional, specifically linked by the links in, near, because, though, neither, nor, to. The only other terms not so linked are the words of modification, the single adverbs and adjectives, early, small, happy, looking, young. First we get one of these, the single word early, then a phrase of time, then two phrases of place, then two contrasting clauses of consequence, then the subject qualified first by an adjective and then by a participle controlling two disjunctive alternative phrases, finally the verb and its object with a qualifying phrase of location. All this variety can be ordered into three parts, the basic section, the predication of subject, the boy climbed the path, the qualifying phrases and clauses signalized by connectives in, near, because, and so on, and the adjectives that assume rather than predicate. That description is fairly technical, and it is a bit hard to follow, but Miles then translates her analysis into the underlying propositions it describes. And by now, this move to unpack unwritten propositions should feel pretty familiar to us. She notes that if the qualifiers and connectives in this sentence are transformed back to their root predications, we would read, the time was early, 
The time was morning. The place was a town. The town was small. The town was near the highway. The boy was young. The boy was hungry. The boy was in danger. The boy did not look to the left. The boy did not look to the right. The boy climbed the path. The path belonged to the city hall. Indeed, Miles explains what she's doing by referring to, you guessed it, that celebrated sentence from the Port Royal Grammarians, invisible God created the visible world. What results from her propositional unpacking is, of course, a highly predicative version. At the other extreme, she shows what might happen if the phrases and clauses of this sentence were to be reduced to qualifiers resulting in a highly adjectival style. Early this morning in a small highway town, hungry and in danger, the young boy looking neither left nor right climbed the city hall path. Miles characterizes the version of this sentence we started with as a mixture of connective and subordinative strategies. Accordingly, she suggests that we can think of prose as having three primary modes of progression, three primary ways in which it takes its steps, the predicative, the connective subordinative, and the adjectival. In other words, these represent different modes of progression for a sentence in which, quote, a defining feature is the delivery of the goods, end of quote. Now, I've slightly modified Miles's overview by calling the predicative style the starting point from which we build longer sentences, and then stating that there are three main ways in which we can go about that building or growing, choosing among and or mixing three strategies for adding propositional information, those strategies being the connective, the subordinative, or the adjectival. Miles starts from her idea that sentences proceed forward in time by taking syntactic steps to develop a very complicated typology of prose styles described by the proportion of parts of speech in the sentence. Counting the ratio of adjective to noun to verb to connective, she then analyzes larger units of prose from various writers in various periods in history using her proportional findings to characterize the style of a historical period. However, since our concern is with building better sentences rather than characterizing the typical sentence structure of 17th or 19th century English, I mention that only in passing. What I want to take away from Miles' approach to sentence style is simply the idea that the sentence unfolds in time by taking steps and that these steps broadly fall into three strategies of adding propositional information. In future lectures, I'll focus on the particular kind of steps the cumulative sentence takes and try to make my case for the advantages it offers the writer. For now, you might want to experiment with each broad strategy to see how natural or unnatural it feels. By the way, these exercises are in your guidebook. Generate a single step or kernel sentence, then generate three more single step or kernel sentences that add information to your original sentence. That will give you four predicative sentences. Your task then is to join these four kernel sentences in as many ways possible within the framework of our broad categories of connective, subordinative, and adjectival modes of progression. Of course, you may also want to consider the possibilities when you create sentences that employ various combinations of these strategies. The point of such an exercise is simply to focus your attention on the fact that we make sentences longer, not just by adding words, but by choosing among these three broad syntactic strategies. Now, here's an example of how this might go. You start with a kernel sentence, my shoes are Nikes. And then you add, my Nikes are designed for playing tennis, my Nikes have air soles, I like their weight. Here's an exa another example. You start with a kernel, breakfast is my favorite meal. And for additions, you add, I like hot food for breakfast, I prefer eggs and bacon to oatmeal, a good breakfast always starts my day off right you'll probably discover that some of these propositions just don't lend themselves to adjectival combination. 
But there's almost always a workaround that lets us express a proposition as a modifying phrase, and it's well worth our trouble to find that option. Since these workarounds soon become familiar to us, and we unconsciously add them to the tools we bring to our writing.